Thank you. We will now restart proceedings and we will proceed with the division on Amendment 15 and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Uh, is Ms Clark seeking to make a point of order? Yeah, I, was, I would have voted yes. The consul wasn't working. Uh, thank you, Ms Clark. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 15 in the name of Paul O'Kane is yes, 58, no, 55. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 1 in the name of the Minister already debated with amendment 15. Minister to move formally. Uh, Minister to move amendment 1 formally. It moved. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Yes. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 15. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Graeme Day. I'm afraid I was unable to vote. I would have voted no. Thank you, uh, Mr Day. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 23 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 27, no, 88. Uh, there were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 2 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 15. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment uh, 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15. Minister to move formally. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. 
We now turn to Group 2, Local Authority Debt Recovery Pre-Action Requirements. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Paul O'Kane uh, in a group of its own. And I call on Paul O'Kane to move and to speak to Amendment uh, 16. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, um, this is, a, again, a similar amendment to one that was brought at Stage 2, but um, we have taken time, I have taken time to reflect on that process at Stage 2 uh, in bringing this amendment back. Amendment 16 would grant ministers the power, if deemed necessary, to make regulations requiring local authorities pursuing debt to take certain actions prior uh, to taking any debt recovery action. This could include directing an individual towards free debt, money and legal advice uh, before a summary warrant is granted uh, by a sheriff. Um, I think people across the Chamber will know that public debt, and in particular council tax arrears, has been a growing problem in Scotland and across uh, the wider UK. And unlike private debt, it is not covered by FCA regulations, which compel lenders to take measures to ensure debtors are treated more fairly and with consideration to vulnerabilities. Uh, a report from Aberlever Children's Charity in 2023 highlighted that 55 per cent of low-income families in Scotland uh, in receipt of universal credit had at least one deduction from their monthly income to cover debts to public bodies. And another recent report from Step Change found that from 2021 uh, and 2022, 32 per cent of uh, their clients were in arrears with their council tax. I don't think it can be right that public bodies and local authorities are on their way to becoming the largest collectors uh, of debt. Uh, and debt collection practices across local authorities is widely varied and in some instances I think can be viewed as problematic uh, and indeed often quite callous. Um, and we've heard, I think, that uh, it related in this chamber before, particularly around the collection of something like school meal debt by sheriff's officers. Uh, so there isn't the same level of protection. I think that's clear and regulation indeed as often applies to private debt. So I think what we would seek is um, we would hope that there would be better practice and more support for individuals, um, which currently we are not uh, seeing. I understand from my engagement with uh, Tom Arthur when he was in the role and indeed my engagement with the minister that um, there is work ongoing with local authorities and cause law in these matters. Indeed, there have been pilot programmes conducted uh, and work done with um, third sector organisations such as Citizens Advice Scotland uh, in order to uh, improve the landscape uh, that I've set out. I, I know that that's under review and that the Scottish Government has not yet decided whether regulations would be the best way to deal with the issues. However, I really don't want uh, for us to be back here in six months or in a year um, after the government has considered all of that and conclude that regulations are indeed needed. But, um, we wouldn't want to uh, indeed miss the boat uh, and require um, further uh, legislation to do that. So what my amendment does and seeks to do is create a regulatory space now without requiring the ministers to use it immediately so that they can continue their ongoing consultation work and engagement around need and the best path forward for regulations and then bring what is necessary when it is necessary uh, and I'm pleased indeed that it has the support, as I've said, of stakeholders such as Citizens Advice Scotland, Aberlour Children's Charity and indeed Govan Law Centre. So I do look forward to hearing from the Minister on the record about the Scottish Government's thinking in terms of public debt and pre-action requirements and I hope uh, he can find his way to backing this amendment today. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Cain. I now call Murdo Fraser. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. I listen with great interest to the case made by uh, Paul O'Kane for his uh, amendment. He's absolutely right to say the largest debts tend to be those owed to public authorities, particularly local authorities, including council tax debt, and they are often the ones most energetic at instructing diligence and instructing sheriff officers and messengers at arms. However, what concerns me about his amendment is why single out local authorities and not any other public agency or indeed any other form of creditor. It does seem perhaps unfair to put a particular burden on local authorities, not put on other creditors. And perhaps when he's winding up, he can tell us what engagement he's had with COSLA on this particular matter and what their view is on his amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I now call on the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Amendment 16 would create a discretionary power for Scottish ministers to set out in regulation what local authorities need to do before they commence debt recovery action. I think the main essence of this amendment is to ensure that debtors are better informed about the debt itself, the help that is available and the potential consequences if they do nothing, and that the local authorities should be doing more to help and support them. 
I would agree, of course, with that in principle, but I do not think it is our place to tell separately democratically accountable local authorities how to go about collecting debts. I do agree that we should be working together across the entire public sector to develop and support best practice in this area, and local authorities are clearly central to this. We have been working with COSLA on promoting best practice on debt assistance and collection, noting the principles set out in the Collaborative Council Tax Collection Report published by the Improvement Service and Step Change Scotland. This aims to use existing flexibilities available to local authorities to take a compassionate and proportionate response to recovery of arrears. Last year, £200,000 was allocated to Citizens Advice Scotland and the CAB Network to provide a pilot project in three local authority areas. The projects will provide additional debt advice to individuals with a focus on council tax arrears and will support best practice in relation to council tax debt collection in their local authority area. This pilot is now completed and I am awaiting the report on its findings. The pilot should provide us with invaluable information and help us establish what is likely to work in the future. While I understand why Amendment 16 has been brought forward today, I would urge all sides to respect local authorities' separate accountability here. We should not be considering legislation until all other routes of promoting best practice have been exhausted. I would therefore ask Paul O'Kane not to press Amendment 16, but if pressed to a vote, I would ask that members reject this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Paul O'Kane to wind up and to press or withdraw uh, Amendment 16. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, I thank both the Minister and Murdo Fraser for their contributions in that debate and indeed the questions that were posed to me around this amendment. And I think there is a degree of consensus about our concern around the, the, the tactics sometimes employed by public sector bodies and indeed the growing uh, scale of public sector debt indeed, and, and the challenge therein. Uh, to Mr Fraser's point, this, this point was made at stage two by his colleague Brian Whittle about why local authorities, and of course that is because local authorities uh, are inhabiting the lion's share of that public sector debt in, in a local way uh, and are using those tactics that I referred to, uh, very concerning, particularly around things like school meal debt, council tax arrears uh, and various other sundry debts that come under councils and indeed they have the power uh, to act to take different approaches and I think we've seen that because this also goes to the Minister's point, there is something of a postcode lottery, if I can use that expression or a variance in approaches taken by local authorities across Scotland and I think that is proving challenging. I mean we've seen for example pilot projects in Tayside, Dundee City Council and others working with Aberlour, as I mentioned, to take different approaches in terms of the principles that they would follow in terms of the collection of that debt and working very intensively with um, debtors in order to get them the right support uh, as required. And, and I think that comes to the broader point uh, where we have agreement and where certainly I have agreement with the Minister, which is we need to support uh, local authorities and public bodies to um, take as many pre-actions as required to support people, to be able to be good, good citizens and of course pay their debt where that is owed, um, but to do that in a way that supports them to be maximising their income uh, and getting all of the, the support that they are of course entitled to. Uh, on uh, the Minister's point about respect for local authorities, I, uh, as a former councillor of 10 years standing, um, have uh, huge respect for local authorities and for the decisions that they make. I do think it's important, however, that this uh, has changed in its nature, this amendment, since stage two. At stage two, I would, I would uh, say we were probably compelling local authorities in a more direct way. Uh, uh, the Minister Tom Arthur and I had an exchange about that in committee uh, of, a, of a similar nature, and it was far more directive to government to then direct local authorities. This is simply a power that will allow Scottish ministers, if required, to make those regulations. Um, obviously, we would want to see uh, a huge degree of uh, consultation and discussion before bringing any uh, uh, powers forward. And I I think that is why I have created this amendment at stage three in this way, in order to do that. And Mr. Fraser asked about my interactions with COSLA. Um, certainly, my discussions uh, with uh, COSLA has been with individual uh, local authority leaders on some of this, um, rather than perhaps with COSLA more directly. I will be uh, honest about that. But um, I think they obviously share the concerns uh, about that postcode lottery that I talk about, and that th these authorities, where there is best practice happening, that should actually be uh, replicated across the country. Now, the minister has said that he intends um, to develop that work and to, to move it forward. But I do think we should have this power on the statute book if it is required. And on that basis, I will press the amendment. Thank you, Mr Kane. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 16 in the name of Paul O'Kane is yes, 33, no, 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now turn to group three, uh, entitled minor. I call amendment four in the name of the minister in a group on its own, and I call on the minister to move and speak to amendment number four. Minister. Sir, amendment four fixes a minor typographical error in section 2A of the bill. It does not represent any change in policy or alter the legal effect of the provision. I move amendment four. Thank you, Minister. I note that no other members have sought to speak, and I uh, ask the Minister whether he has anything further to add by way of wind up. The Minister does not. The question is, therefore, that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I now turn to group four. Protected trust deeds, information and time to be uh, provided to debtor. I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister, in a group of its own, and I call on the Minister to move and speak to Amendment 5. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government recognises that clarity and transparency in the information that is provided to those seeking a solution to problem debt is extremely important. Uh, this amendment comes from a recommendation made by the previous Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee in their short inquiry into protected trust deeds and was endorsed by stakeholders. I agree that getting the right information in a clear format will help empower that individual to make the right decision for their circumstances. This amendment will help achieve that objective. It will create a requirement for a trustee to provide the individual with a copy of trustee information document in addition to the debt advice and information package that is already required before the individual grants the trustee. The trusted information document will help provide important information presenting the benefits and consequences of signing a trustee to allow the individual to assess if this is the right step for them. This amendment therefore expands the range of information and advice that must be provided to the individual before a trustee is signed. The amendment will also create a requirement for the trustee to give the individual adequate time to consider this information before the trustee is signed. What is meant by this cooling off period will be further outlined in guidance published by Scottish Ministers, which the trustee must have regard to. This will ensure that the individual has enough time to digest the information and the other information and advice provided under Section 1673A of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 and seek further advice of the see fit before taking the serious step of signing a trust deed. I am aware that the previous Minister had planned to meet with representatives of insolvency practitioners who raised some concerns that this amendment was not necessary. I apologise to them that the time available since my appointment has not been possible to do that. However, the amendment reflects the existing best practice and I believe it is right to ensure that all trustees are required by statute to meet that standard. Members will be aware that concerns remain about the trustee market, and while it is only a small step in terms of improving transparency, it is nevertheless one that is worth taking. Further proposals to introduce improvements to the current protected trustee process are being brought forward by the protected trustee miscellaneous amendment Scotland Regulations 2024. The regulations bring forward stakeholder-led recommendations that will help ensure the statutory solution is fit for purpose and provides the necessary support and protection to those who, who need access to debt relief through this solution. I move Amendment 5. Thank you, Minister. I call Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think I need to put on record some of the concerns that have been raised with me and I'm sure others uh, in the Chamber by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland around what is being proposed here. We did have a, a discussion in the Economy and Fair Work Committee uh, uh, this week around protected trust deeds and explored some of these issues. I think as a general rule, we should only legislate where legislation is necessary. If there are voluntary uh, uh, practices working well, there is no need for legislation, in, in my view. And that is the view being expressed by uh, ICAS in relation to the uh, amendment we have before us today. The uh, amendment requires uh, information to be provided 
to debtors before they enter a trust deed. In practice, that already happens. In fact, as I can say, there is no evidence that debtors are not currently being provided with the information before they enter a trust deed. Therefore, it is difficult to see what is the social ill that this legislation tries to cure, because there is no evidence that it is actually required. Uh, ICAS also make uh, the point that the principle of adequate information and time to consider debt solutions, if that is something the government wants to take forward, should not just apply to protected trustees, but should apply to all statutory debt solutions, including the debt arrangement scheme and to sequestration. And therefore, their view, which seems reasonable, is that we need a more holistic consideration of these issues, rather than this being brought in on a piecemeal basis and brought in only in relation to protected trust deeds, as this amendment does. Uh, and finally, I think it is their concern that there has not been adequate discussion and consultation on this. The Minister did reflect the fact that uh, his predecessor in office, Tom Arthur, had promised the Government would be allowing a further stakeholder discussion on these matters before bringing forward this amendment. That did not happen. And therefore, this is being brought in without proper discussion and, and conversation. So, to our view, this is uh, premature, uh, and uh, in our view, there are better ways of approaching this issue rather than bringing forward these particular, this particular amendment at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. And I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. In some ways, I'm very relieved that Murdo Fraser preceded m my contribution because my expertise in matters of accountancy is somewhat similar to uh, my expertise in matters of the law. Uh, but I think he uh, made a good point. Obviously, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland uh, have really, uh, just in the last uh, couple of days, uh, uh, provided us with this information. But I think they make uh, um, some important points. Uh, the fact that the, the statement of insolvency practice SIP 3.3 requires insolvency uh, practitioners to provide the sort of information that seems to be alluded to uh, in the amendment uh, does uh, at least seem to suggest that, that it's unnecessary. And critically, I think if undertakings uh, were given uh, to uh, consult uh, with uh, uh, practitioners uh, and the relevant uh, professions, that really should have taken place. So for me, it's a very important point of principle when we're uh, dealing with legislation, especially relating to professional practice or, or uh, 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 matters of business, that those decisions should be made in partnership uh, with those people that it affects. And I think particularly um, from professional bodies such as ICAS or indeed the Law Society when it pertains to matters of the law, those decisions should be made in, uh, in consultation with them uh, and uh, we need to take their views very seriously. That, that notwithstanding, uh, I, think we, I, I heard what the Minister has said and I think uh, the position of the Labour benches is that we would seek to abstain just because of the, the, the late notice and it's very difficult to scrutinise these. But I really wanted to make a, a point and make that a, 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 on the record that I think we do need to treat with some concern uh, the contribution and submission made by uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Scotland. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I call on the Minister to wind up. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and uh, I thank Murdo Fraser and Daniel Johnson for their contributions uh, on this matter, and, and also thank ICAS for uh, their submission um, around this issue. And again, I reiterate uh, an apology uh, for being unable to engage with them um, in advance of this debate as a consequence of the, uh, the very recent changeover of ministerial responsibilities. I would just remind um, uh, members of uh, the fact that this was a recommendation um, made by, uh, specifically made by the previous Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee um, and was endorsed by stakeholders and I think from government's perspective, from my perspective, um, it's important that we ensure that individuals, debtors that are about to take this very serious step of uh, signing a, a trust deed are provided with information in an easily accessible form at the point where uh, they are making that, uh, that important decision. And this is um, a step to ensure that that happens in a consistent way that allows them to be fully appraised, um, as I say, in an accessible, easily communicated way of the step that they are about to, about to take. Um, so in that uh, regard, I would ask that uh, members support this amendment. And uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
the, the vote is now closed. Point of order, Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer, and apologies I couldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Gray. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number five in the name of Ivan McKee is yes, 65, no, 25. There were 22 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I now turn to group five, service of documents, and I call amendment six in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and I call on Colin Smith to move amendment six and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to move Amendment 6 in my name uh, and speak to all the other amendments in this group. The purpose of my amendments are to ensure that bank and earnings arrestments are only served in person where it is impossible or impracticable to do so by post or electronically. Concerns were brought to the attention of members by Alan McIntosh from Advice Talk Scotland ahead of Stage 2 of the Bill that an unintended consequence of government amendments at that stage to introduce digital as a means to serve bank and earnings arrestments, but not ensure that serving these arrestments in person should remain a last resort, risk it becoming a first resort in some cases. Serving these arrestments in person brings with it a hefty fee for the recipient. The Minister's predecessor, Tom Arthur, fully recognised this at stage two, and I am grateful to the current Minister and his officials for working with me to develop amendments that will introduce a requirement that earnings and bank arrestments can only be served personally if it is not possible or impractical to serve them digitally or by post. This could reduce Sheriff officers' fees that are passed on to an individual in debt, ensuring their financial situation is not exasperated unnecessarily. As Citizens Advice Scotland also highlight in their briefing ahead of this debate, this will also avoid the stigma that can exist as many individuals can feel shame and embarrassment by the presence of sheriff officers serving arrestment notices in person. My amendments complement Maggie Chapman's Amendment uh, 25, which also deals with charges, but those relating to before earnings arrestment. So I would encourage members to support the amendments in this group. Uh, Mr Smith, could you uh, move Amendment 6? I move, move. Thank you. Um, I now call Maggie Chapman to speak to Amendment 25 and other amendments in the group. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I speak to my amendment, I would just like to put on record my thanks to the Minister, to Tom Arthur, the Minister who previously had responsible, uh, responsibility for this bill, and to all those who I have had conversations with uh, over, the, over the last few weeks about amendments. I am also very grateful to all of those who provided briefings and information in advance of this afternoon's discussion. Just to confirm, we will also be supporting Colin Smith's amendments in this group. But turning to my Amendment 25, it requires Sheriff officers to try and serve a 14-day charge for payment by post or digitally first, before they decide to serve it personally. And it does not interfere with the other amendments in this group, as Colin Smith has already outlined. The reason why it is important that there are, is that there are over 200,000 charged for payments served each year, and the cost of postal diligence, which is when sheriff officers add the fees to people's debts, is £48.01, whilst the cost of personal uh, diligence, the personal service, is £96.27. The cost of the personal service, therefore, is twice as much as that of postal diligence. This amount could, therefore, save people, some of whom will already be struggling with debt, £9 to £10 million a year in sheriff office fees. This will not cost the public purse any money. It will significantly reduce the amount of debt people need to pay to, pri to primarily council tax, and it won't cost sheriff officers anything. It will, however, just reduce the profitability for those sheriff officers of doing diligence in the way they currently do. And I move the amendment in my name. Uh, thank you, Ms Chapman, and I call on the Minister. 
Thank you, President Officer. Um, President Officer, I am aware of the concerns um, previously raised by a stakeholder at the Government Stage 2 amendments on the service of arrestment schedules on the RSD or employer may have had some unintended consequences, encouraging personal service over less intrusive and less expensive methods. Um, as the Minister for Community Wealth and Public Finance highlighted during the Stage 2 debate, this was not the policy intention, and I have since had an opportunity to discuss this matter with Colin Smith, and I am grateful to the member for working constructively with the Government and happy to support his amendments 6 to 9 and 11 to 14, which will remedy the unintended consequence and reflect the policy intention of providing an additional method of service by electronic means. Amendments 6 to 9 amend Section 6 relating to arrestment and action of forthcoming, and Amendments 11 to 14 amend Section 7 relating to diligence against earnings to specify that the arrest arrestment schedules must be served either by post, registered or recorded delivery, or transmitted by electronic means, for example, email, where the intended recipient has agreed to receive documents electronically. Additionally, these amendments will enable arrestment documents to be served by other competent means, but only where it is impossible or impractical to serve documents by post or electronically. Turning to Amendment 25, this seeks to provide for electronic service for charge, charges for payment. Um, as Maggie Chapman has said, there are over a quarter of a million such charges served every year. They are the final warning before the start of formal diligence. Again, the bulk will be issued by councils in pursuit of council tax debt. Before Ms Chapman laid this amendment uh, last week, I have not been aware of any stakeholder asking for this change, and it is one I think we should take time to consult on. It is all too easy, of course, for an individual to overlook an email or a letter and then find themselves um, in serious difficulty. Personal service reflects the seriousness of a charge for payment, the need for action by the debtor, and often comes after previous attempts to resolve an outstanding debt have been ignored. I would, however, be happy to take forward discussions with sheriff officers, councils, debt charities and others if they felt this would be of value. I therefore support amendments 6 to 9 and 11 to 14, but would ask Ms Chapman not to press amendment 25. But if amendment 25 is pressed, I would ask Parliament not to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Colin Smith to wind up and to press withdraw Amendment 6. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I am grateful for the support for my amendments. I appreciate the Government's amendments at Stage 2 created an unintended consequence, which was not the, the policy aim. Uh, and my amendment seeks to right this. In doing so, it may reduce the, the level of sheriff officers' fees that are passed on to an individual in debt, ensuring their already incredibly difficult financial situation is not unnecessarily exasperated by the personal servant of an arrestment when simpler and more cost-effective means are available. I am therefore happy to press my amendment 6. Thank you, Mr Smith. The question is, that Amendment 6 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Parliament is agreed. I call Amendments 7, 8 and 9 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 6, and I invite Colin Smith to move Amendments 7 to 9 en bloc. It moved. Uh, thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 7 to 9? No member objects. The question is that Amendments 7 to 9 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now turn to Group 6, Attachment of Property or Funds. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Paul O'Kane, grouped with Amendments 10, 19, 22 and 24. And I call on Paul O'Kane to move Amendment 17 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr O'Kane. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I rise to move Amendment 17, which would propose a requirement for the protected minimum uh, amount of bank account arrestment to be uprated annually if Scottish ministers deem it to have materially fallen below the inflation level. Uh, the, Re the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Act amended the Debtors Act of 1973 to allow the Scottish ministers to vary the minimum protected balances by way of negative procedure. I think there is an opportunity to strengthen uh, power such as this to provide more protection for vulnerable individuals dealing with bank account arrestment proceedings. When the 2022 Act passed, I don't think um, any of us would have seen the huge spikes in inflation that have come our way uh, in the intervening uh, period. And whilst I would recognise that the existing power allows ministers to deal with sudden changes that will require them to alter minimum protected balances, 
a regulatory power that remains in addition to my amendment, I think this opens up a conversation about whether, in a period of volatile inflation, uh, the cost of living uh, continuing to increase, and uh, that there, do, there does need to be consideration given to more regular up ratings. And that is not a novel idea, uh, I do not think, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it is something that we do across a, a number of issues, not least uh, social security payments, recognising the vulnerability uh, people uh, who are in receipt of those payments often find themselves in, and their need for payments to keep uh, pace with inflation. So, given that my amendment would create a regular requirement for Scottish ministers to calculate the inflation adjusted level by the end of each financial year, and if they deem the existing protected balance to be materially below that inflation adjusted level, they would lay regulations to change the amount. Uh, and that would ensure the uprating of vitally important minimum protected balances are not just done on an ad hoc basis, as and when uh, ministers are motivated to do that, but um, actually that there is a process for modest but nonetheless important uplifts to those minimum balances on that annual basis, if need be. And I do think that would provide greater security and protection to vulnerable individuals going through debt collection and subjects to bank account arrestment by ensuring that inflation cannot eat away at the protection they are already being afforded. I think, therefore, it is an important safeguard. I am pleased that the amendment has uh, won the backing of stakeholders. I do look forward to hearing the Minister's response, because I do know that uh, it is something he has given wider consideration to and, uh, indeed, would, will want to, I am sure, comment further. Uh, very briefly on other amendments in the group, I think in the similar vein that um, the underlying uh, principle of my amendment is guaranteeing more protections for vulnerable debtors, I do welcome suggestions from my colleague Colin Smith and indeed the uh, amendment from Maggie Chapman, uh, which runs along those similar lines. And I look forward to uh, hearing the detail from them in terms of their amendments and the difference that it will make to people who find themselves in very vulnerable situations often. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. I call Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 10 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, bank arrestments of benefits are illegal. They are statutorily protected. They should not be arrested under any circumstances, but we know they are. Citizen Advice Scotland rightly describes such arrestments as immoral and unduly harsh. At stage two, I brought forward an amendment with the aim of preventing the arrestment in a bank account of any funds wholly acquired through social security benefits. I did not press the amendment at that stage, given that the then ministers made a commitment at the time to work with me in developing a workable solution, a way forward on this matter. And I am grateful to the current minister and his officials for the constructive discussions we have had. I believe there is a, a clear consensus on the policy aim of my amendment at stage two, so I am reassured there is a desire to find that way forward. But I recognise that a number of issues were raised in response to my amendment at stage two. Firstly, that the right level of protection should, in theory, be provided to all those who need it, whether their income is solely from welfare benefits or from other sources or from a mix of the two. Secondly, banks also express concerns about the difficulties um, they have identifying the source of funds in an account, and clearly this does need to be resolved to make any uh, improvement workable. The Economy and Fair Work Committee also received representations from academics at Aberdeen University, which suggested that we should consider an alternative approach to achieve the same outcome through an amendment of the unduly harsh test. This test is currently seen as a barrier because the debtor has to apply to the Sheriff Court and, because of their circumstances, may well be reluctant to incur the cost of this. However, there may be other ways to address this through an administrative procedure. In discussion with the Minister and, official, and his officials, they also expressed uh, their, their view that, given that my amendment deals with Social Security benefits, it is important to make absolutely sure that any changes that are made fully respect the devolved settlement. I have therefore brought forward uh, Amendment 10 to commit the Government to carry out a consultation on the most appropriate solution, together with an enabling power to lay regulations which will be subject to affirmative procedure. The aim here is to ensure that any proposals that are brought forward are properly tested and all the relevant stakeholders are given the opportunity to have input. But I am very clear, President Officer, and I would ask the Minister to assure Parliament that that solution will be brought forward in the timescales my amendment set, and Parliament will be given the opportunity to consider the matter, given that we all want to see a workable solution. Amendment 19 in my name would enable individuals to make an application to their creditor to vary their wage arrestment due to their circumstances and household composition. This amendment would allow creditors to replace the specified amounts in the tables detailed in Amendment 22 with a lower percentage amount above the protected minimum amount where the circumstances of a household require it. Those in debt would be able to request this from their creditor once every six months, and the creditor would be required to consider it. 
I believe that Section 50, as currently drafted, would be wide enough to allow someone in debt to request a review from the court where there is a dispute as to whether the decision to refuse a request is reasonable. People with local authority creditors would also have the option of using their council's complaints procedure if they disagree with the decision, and people with consumer credit lenders could use a firm's complaints procedure to request a review. Concerns have been raised this could occur too frequently, which is why a limit of making an application only once in any six-month period is included. I understand that the seven different earnings arrestments in Scotland, variations are possible for five of them at present, and this includes arrestments to arrest funds for the payment of a trust deed and sequestration, including by the accountant in bankruptcy. I note that Citizen Advice Scotland support this proposal. They say it would allow individuals to still make a payment to their debts, but at an amount which is more affordable and sustainable, and it does not cause financial distress uh, and takes account of their individual circumstances. They also say having the flexibility to apply directly to the creditor for consideration will remove the need for court involvement except where there is a dispute, freeing up court time and allowing greater communication between the parties involved. Moreover, they highlight that the restriction of only being able to make this application once every six months will ensure it is not abused or overused, but be a genuine vehicle for flexibility. Uh, finally, Amendment 22 uh, uh, introduced a new earnings a new earning arrestment model, uh, effectively a protected minimum balance of £1,000 similar to bank arrestments. This is a, a revision to the model I proposed at stage two. Uh, this revision is designed to address some of the, the concerns that were raised about the cost to creditors, primarily local authorities. It has been brought to my attention that there is a, a very minor drafting error in the tables uh, provided along with my amendment. However, these would likely to have a minimal impact. Uh, and this is primarily a probing amendment. My revised amendments would mean the protected minimum amount would be increased to £1,000 for net monthly salaries, with no deduction being taken from net salaries below that amount. It would introduce a new threshold that deductions will be calculated with and changes the current thresholds. No one earning less than £1,500 monthly would pay more than they currently do, and those earning more than £1,500 each month would pay more, but only slightly, with the increased amount increasing as net salaries increase. I am, however, keen to hear what plans the Government have on this matter. As I indicated earlier, this is primarily a probing amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. I now call Maggie Chapman to speak to Amendment 24 and other amendments in the group. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We need a clear statement in law that arrestment of benefits is not competent. I hope that I am not the only one in the belief that it should not be possible to take child disability payments, adult disability payments, Scottish child payments or any other benefits to which people are entitled away from them. My amendment seeks to make this clear on the face of the bill because, as Colin Smith has already stated, this practice does still happen. In earlier discussions, a similar proposal was criticised because it might be difficult for banks to know what money is what. However, this is addressed in my amendment with instructions to the court when an action under Section 73M of the De Debtor Scotland Act 1987 is raised. Courts understand what is and what is not a benefit payment, and bank statements can be used to confirm this. So I am not asking banks to determine what would or would not be competent. This is completely in line with what the courts held in Crossan v North Lanarkshire Council and Airdrie Savings Bank in 2008 and Mackenzie v City of Edinburgh in 2023. My, my amendment puts this issue beyond doubt, and because it also has an express waiver in it to prevent bank, banks being held liable, it gives them the protections that they currently do not have. I believe it will also reduce the need for the use of notices of objection. Currently, in multiple cases, the courts have held that where funds are benefits, then they are protected. But because, of the decision, because the decision of one sheriff is not binding on other sheriffs, it means that the practice of taking benefit money, even when it has shown that it is benefit money, continues. Added to this, many people would not perhaps feel able to challenge such arrestments as they don't want to or are scared of going to court. I hope this amendment will avoid them having to do that. As we look ahead to changes in how social security in Scotland functions, thinking specifically about the forced migration of universal credit being rolled out, more people will likely have more than £1,000 in their bank account at certain points in, 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 in the month, as their housing costs and support for their children will be getting paid with their universal credit. Scottish child payments will add further to the amounts of money people might have in their bank account at any one time. So it's possible that the protected minimum balance of £1,000 will not be enough to help people. 
Another criticism made to this proposal that it wasn't clear how this ban would interact with that protected minimum balance. And my answer is that it's quite clear it doesn't. If the arrestment is incompetent or void, then the funds must be released in full and the protected minimum balance is not activated. The different situation is when wages and benefits are mixed together. Then the protective minimum balance is activated. And, but the arrestment of the benefit section is not competent, although the wage section is. It's then appropriate un under Section 73Q of the Debtor Scotland Act 1987 when the court uh, can decide on how much to release. This is what, so so I, I ask that uh, people across the chamber will support this amendment as I believe it gives protection to people, so, to protection of their benefits to which they are entitled. And to confirm, we will also be supporting Colin Smith's amendments in this group. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now invite the Minister to respond. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, as Mr O'Kane said, Amendment 17 proposes to create a requirement on ministers to review on an annual basis the protected minimum balance when bank account arrestments are executed and uprate this figure is materially lower than the inflation adjusted figure and amend this through affirmative regulations. The protected minimum balance is an important protection for individuals, so only funds above the minimum in a bank account can be attached by a creditor. The figure for the protected balance was increased to £1,000 as recently as November 2022, following changes made by the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Act 2022. This was a significant increase of roughly 52 per cent from the figure which applied before then. This was done very much from the viewpoint of wanting to protect universal credit payments, and we need to consider the interaction of all the various protections. The 2022 Act also gave ministers the power to further vary the figure by negative procedure regulations. The power is there already. I believe that the existing power approved just two years ago is the appropriate method to change the figures. I do not think we need the confusion of an additional power and an annual statutory obligation. This additional power proposed by Amendment 17 does itself leave some questions unanswered, such as what inflation measures should be used or when the figures should be measured in order to have regulations ready for the new financial year. For these reasons, the Government cannot support it. Turning to Amendment 10, at Stage 2 of this Bill, Colin Smith lodged an amendment to clarify whether Social Security benefits can be attached by a bank account arrestment. The aim of that amendment was to protect funds wholly deriving from Social Security payments automatically and without the need for any challenge by a debtor. I agree with the intent of the amendment lodged at Stage 2. Welfare payments should be protected for the purpose for which they are paid. I also agree that this issue needs some clarity. There are, however, some practical concerns that need to be considered, and we need to have an opportunity to consult with stakeholders on how best to address these matters. I have had the opportunity to speak to Mr Smith about his previous amendment, and I am grateful to the member for working constructively with the Government to find a workable solution on this issue, and one that we are happy to support. Amendment 10 does two things. Firstly, it requires the Government to consult on these issues. It seems entirely appropriate that that consultation should also address the correct mechanism and timing for the future regular uprating of bank arrestment thresholds. And on the back of that commitment, I ask Paul O'Kane not to press Amendment 17. Secondly, Amendment 10 creates an enabling power to introduce changes through regulation on the basis of that consultation. That enabling power is sufficiently broad to allow a range of solutions to meet the overriding aim on which we agree, depending on what is going to work best, either by stopping prescribed methods of funds in a bank account from being attached, or by providing a simpler administrative process to get those funds released if they are attached, or alternatively to explore other solutions that might come out of the consultation. An enabling power will give us time to get to a solution that will work. Given that we are at stage three of the bill, I think that is better than putting measures on the face of the bill which might then not work in practice. That seems a reasonable approach given that we are in agreement with the outcome we want to achieve and the debate really is how, about how best to get there. As a safeguard, given that this is a broad delegated power, the amendment requires the Government to make a statement to Parliament giving details of the responses to the consultation, what specific changes they propose as a result of the consultation and their reasoning. Colin Smith has also lodged Amendment 19, which introduces a new process into earnings arrestments. It would allow a debtor to apply to their creditor to amend the amount of earnings arrested to take account of their household circumstances. I understand that during the Economy and Fair Work Committee's evidence session on this bill, they heard from stakeholders who drew attention to cases where debtors struggle as a result of a deduction from their earnings. 
It was pointed out that too often a debtor only seeks advice and support from an arrestment of earnings uh, after an arrestment of earnings has been imposed and as a result has missed their opportunity to engage with their creditor and agree terms of repayment on a voluntary basis. However, I have some difficulties with the amendment, which means that I cannot support it. It is not clear how it would work in practice, and there does not appear to be any consequence for a creditor who refuses to agree to a request or who simply ignores it. Meanwhile, the statutory obligations we would pose on creditors are unclear. How is a creditor trying to comply to assess what is reasonable for an individual? How are they to assess the accuracy of the information the individual has provided? Surely the answer is for this Parliament to set the right level once for everyone, rather than ask every small business to have, an assess, have to assess what is reasonable for a family to live on. I am sympathetic to the aim of the amendment to make sure that earnings arrestments do not put individuals into an unacceptable financial difficulties, but there have, has been no consultation with any of those creditors who would have to put this into effect, nor with employers who would have to deal with a stream of requests to amend salary deductions. As I will explain in a moment, I am committed to consulting on a different approach to the bandings for earnings arrestments to reduce their impact on those earning least. And it strikes me that that will be a fairer and more effective way of addressing this issue. Colin Smith's final amendment in this group, Amendment 22, increases the monetary threshold above which an earnings arrestment can take effect. It would reduce the amount that a creditor can recover each pay period to repay the debt, and when a person earns less than £1,000 per month, it would remove the ability to recover the debt through an earnings arrestment altogether. Over 90 per cent of earnings arrestments are served by local authorities seeking to recover unpaid council tax. They have found this diligence to be the most effective means of recovering debt. I have heard concerns from COSLA, and I understand they have also written to the committee outlining concerns about changes to the current system of earnings arrestments and the potential impact this would have on councils' ability to deliver services to their communities. Potential amount of council tax collected could be reduced by up to £20 million a year if Amendment 22 were passed. COSA also made clear that local authorities only use earning arrestment as a last resort where someone has refused to engage with them over the debt. Earnings arrestments are also a very valuable tool for the enforcement of court fines, and I am sure none of us would want to make it easier for individuals to avoid paying fines of this nature. We need to strike the balance between protecting those who can't pay while ensuring efficient, efficient enforcement against those who won't pay. I am very aware that we are still emerging from a period of high inflation and that many families are still struggling with the impacts of the cost crisis, so I accept we need to do more. I will commit now to bringing forward the next increase in earnings arrestment thresholds to April 1st next year, two years earlier than would normally be the case. And I will launch a consultation shortly to look at the bandings within earnings arrestments. My aim here will be to make sure that those earning less than £1,000 a month will see at least a 50 per cent reduction in the payments they face, while councils and other creditors' finances are protected by our asking those who earn more to pay more. On the back of these commitments, I would ask the member not to press Amendment 22. Finally, Maggie Chapman's Amendment 24 deals with an issue considered by the committee at Stage 2 in dealing with an amendment lodged by Colin Smith. It does, however, take a different approach to achieve the intended outcome and proposes some protection for debtors who might be excluded by a rule requiring that funds come wholly from Social Security benefits by discounting small amounts of payments of specific other kinds. The amendment inserts new provisions into section 73M of the 1987 Act, which sets out the process by which a debtor may object to the automatic release of arrested funds to a creditor. The grounds of objection available to a debtor include that the arrestment has been executed incompetently or irregularly. Amendment 24 would provide that an arrestment has been executed incompetently where it attaches funds wholly derived from Social Security benefits. It may not be the intention of the amendment, that, but that approach seems to restrict any other reasons being used to suggest an arrestment has been executed incompetently. Otherwise, my concern about this is the same as with the original amendment at stage two. I agree with the aim, but I believe we need to engage with stakeholders in order to make sure we achieve it in the best possible way. Therefore, while I am sympathetic to Amendment 24, I urge the member to withdraw on the basis that the alternative Amendment 10 lodged by Colin Smith will ultimately be more effective at achieving the substance of what the member wants to achieve. In conclusion, President Officer, the Government asks members to reject Amendments 17, 19, 22 and 24, but to support Colin Smith's Amendment 10 as the best way to progress further reform here. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call Paul O'Kane to wind up press of withdrawal amendment 17. Mr. O'Kane. 
Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think that was a particularly constructive and helpful debate on uh, the set of amendments and indeed on the issues therein. And I think uh, the Minister perhaps summed it up when he spoke about the pressures uh, that still exist um, from a very volatile period, uh, indeed in terms of inflation and in terms of the uncertainty for people across the country dealing with uh, the cost of living. And I think what the amendments in this section have sought to do is to ensure that those who are in debt uh, and are, are being uh, pursued for that debt, that they are given the right support to protect uh, their incomes and the balances uh, within their, their accounts, particularly for those who are in receipt uh, of social security. Uh, I have heard what the Minister has said in terms of uh, his view and the Government's view of the provisions that already exist within the, the Coronavirus Act and indeed uh, the, the work that has already been done in terms of increasing uh, the minimum uh, income, uh, minimum balance, sorry. Uh, and indeed, I, I recognise that uh, the Minister's view that there is a provision within that legislation which will enable him uh, and the Government uh, going forward in order to vary that um, as uh, is required. So I think on that basis and from that assurance to the Minister, uh, I won't uh, press uh, Amendment uh, 17. Uh, I think we then had a, a series of uh, important um, discussions around uh, Colin Smith amendments, which I thought uh, have, have sought to uh, ensure that there is um, more detail behind uh, protecting um, those uh, balances. Uh, I, I would welcome, I think, the Minister's um, interaction and collaboration with Colin Smith in order to uh, bring forward uh, Amendment 10 and to do that in a way that will um, consult uh, fully and test those principles, as Colin Smith uh, outlined in his contribution. And of course, I would also welcome the Minister's commitment here today to bring forward by two years um, those um, earnings arrestment levels uh, and looking at them in far more detail, far sooner than otherwise would have been the case, and to do that in the constructive way that he set out across the Parliament. Uh, on Maggie Chapman's amendment, uh, I think, again, we uh, understand uh, the principle and we, we respect that and we understand uh, where that comes from. Um, we would obviously um, point to um, Colin Smith's work at uh, uh, Amendment 10, but also indeed some of the concerns that I think have been expressed around um, uh, competency, uh, devolved competency, and indeed um, the provisions uh, and the restrictions that may come as uh, an adverse effect to the 1987 Act. So whilst I understand, uh, and understand the principle and, and would support that principle, uh, I, I do think we have to just be a, a little careful there. So uh, in summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think it's been important to have this debate this afternoon and in order to move forward in a constructive way with the government, uh, as I hope we will do uh, when we, we come to vote on these amendments. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Just to confirm, you wish to withdraw the amendment. Yeah. Thank you. Paul Kane seeks to withdraw Amendment 17. Does any member object? No members object. Uh, amendment 17 is therefore withdrawn. We move on to Group uh, 7, Arrestment Duty of Disclosure. I call Amendment 18 in the name of Murdo Fraser. Group with Amendments 20 and 21. Murdo Fraser to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the group. Mr. Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My three amendments in this group. 18, 20 and 21 address points that were discussed in paragraphs 127 to 134 of the committee's stage one report. Sections six and seven of the bill introduce a new duty of disclosure on the arrestee. The arrestee uh, is the person who is in possession of the assets belonging to the debtor, usually a bank or a financial institution, would be required to tell the creditor when diligence has been unsuccessful. That is a new requirement that has been introduced. The arrestee must tell the creditor whether the arrestment has been successful within a specified time period of 21 days. Now, as the committee heard in evidence, the issue here is that this would have a significant resource uh, implication for banks and other financial institutions. And in its submission to the committee, the NatWest Group said it would have to respond to approximately 70,000 arrestment requests every year. And there would be no particular purpose in telling creditors that those requests had been unsuccessful. If they are successful, of course, they are required to report. If they are unsuccessful, currently they are not. But what this does is put an unduly onerous requirement on financial institutions. So amendments 18, 20, 20 and 21, what I'm proposing is a halfway house. They're not about entirely removing the obligation for disclosure but they try to qualify that requirement and make it less onerous for financial institutions. 
Amendment 18 relates to cases in which the arrestee must disclose information in relation to bank arrestments that have been unsuccessful. It provides that the arrestee need disclose information to the creditor only where the creditor requests that information, where it was not under summary warrant procedure, and that that information should be provided as soon as reasonably practical. Amendment 20 amends Section 7 of the Bill to say that a person should respond only to a specific request that has been made. And Amendment 21 says a person needs to respond only as soon as reasonably practical after the request has been received, rather than within 21 days. Now, to me, these strike a reasonable balance. The Bill, as it stands, proposes a new onerous requirement on arrestees to report. The costs of doing that may well be significant. I do not know if the Minister has looked at what the likely costs will be, uh, but the banks tell us it could be substantial. And my amendments are not about removing the requirements report altogether. They are about trying to qualify it and strike the bal a balance between the interests of the creditor and the interests of the arrestee. So they seem to be a very reasonable set of proposals. I submitted these same, same amendments at stage two, where we had a debate around this issue. They were defeated on division by five votes to four, and I hope the Minister has had time to reflect and will recognise the good sense of what I propose. And I'm pleased, uh, Presiding Officer, to move Amendment 18. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Uh, thank you. President Officer, the Scottish Government thanks uh, Murdo Fraser for his proposed amendments uh, 18, 20 and 21. And as we have heard, these amendments would remove the requirements for the arrestee of the bank or the employer to notify the creditor in all instances when no property has been attached or an earnings arrestment has been unsuccessful, and replace it with the requirement to only notify the creditor where the creditor specifically requests confirmation. They would also remove the requirement for the notification to be sent within a defined period of 21 days of the arrestment schedule being sent, replacing it with a duty to respond as soon as reasonably practicable following receipt of a request from a creditor. Amendment 18 goes further as it prevents those who use summary warrants from being able to request this information. This includes local authorities and HMRC, in fact, excluding the vast majority of arrestments from this duty. The current proposals in the Bill come from the report of the Diligence Working Group, which included representatives of the Committee of Scottish Banks, HMRC, SMASO, ICAS and the Debt Advice Charities. When we consulted on their recommendations in 2022, over 90 per cent of respondents supported these moves. That included sheriff officers and creditor representatives, such as Abco, who said notification from the banks where arrestment is unsuccessful is essential in decision-making going forward. We agree that we do not want to put an unnecessary burden on the banks, and we will, of course, have the flexibility to determine when these sections of the bill will come into force. Uh, that will give us time to work with the banks, employers and sheriff officers to make sure that the reporting burden is kept to an absolute minimum. Uh, President officer, there is something strange going on in the world of bank arrestments. Although something like 200,000 are served every year, the latest figures from SMASO are that only around 2 per cent result in any money being returned to creditors. This suggests everyone in the system is having to do a great deal of potential unnecessary work. We won't be able to understand why and to put things right here until we know more about what is happening in each and every case. These same amendments were considered and rejected by the committee at stage two. As my predecessor did then, I want to urge members against agreeing them. They have the potential to prevent or delay creditors receiving important information. And they will leave us without the evidence base we need in order to determine how to improve the process. For those reasons, the government does not support amendments 18, 20 and 21. And I ask Murdo Fraser not to press them. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Murdo Fraser to wind up press or withdraw Amendment 18. Mr Fraser. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I didn't hear the Minister say in his remarks if he'd looked at the likely cost of uh, introducing this new measure to the banks. If he wants to intervene in me, I'm happy to, to give way. Minister. Uh, as I've indicated in my remarks, we are very keen to engage with the banking sector to understand uh, this process, the burden it places on them, to uh, work with them, to look for automation of solutions to make this process as, uh, as, as easy as, uh, as possible to implement um, and to take evidence from them on potential costs uh, that they, they, they may be incurring as a consequence um, in advance of us setting the date um, in consultation with them as to when these measures would come into force. Murdo Fraser. 
Uh, I, th I thank the, the Minister for that uh, clarification. I am aware the Minister has been engaging with, with, with the financial services sector uh, around these matters. In the light of the assurances he's, he's given us, I'm happy not to press these amendments. Thank you, Mr Fraser. Just to confirm, you're withdrawing the amendment. Withdraw amendment 18. Yeah. Thank you. Murdo Fraser seeks to withdraw amendment 18. Does any other member object? No member objects. Therefore, Amendment 18 is withdrawn. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Moved. question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with amend Amendment 17. Colin Smith, to move or not move? N not moved. That is not moved. Uh, and I call amendments 11, 12, 13 and 14 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with amendment 6. I invite Colin Smith to move amendments 11 to 14 on block. It moved. Thank you. Does any member object uh, to a single question being put on amendments 11 to 14? Nobody objects. Uh, the question is that amendments 11 to 14 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 18. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not move. That is not moved. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 18. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not moved. That is not uh, moved. And I call Amendment 22 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. That is not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 24 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 17. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. I, the question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. So find yourself on the same page. For And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Craig Hoy. Deputy Presiding Officer, my app either froze uh, or something odd happened in the screen. I would have voted no, but it may, it may have been recorded. I can assure you your vote was recorded, Mr Hoy. Order, Richard Leonard. Point of order, Presiding Officer, um, uh, my app uh, locked me out. If it hadn't, I would have abstained. Thank you, Mr Leonard. I will ensure that vote is recorded. Point of order, Monica Lennon. I could not connect. I'm still trying to connect and uh, I would have abstained. Thank you, Ms Lennon. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on Amendment 24 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 10, no, 83. There were 21 abstentions, therefore the amendment is not uh, agreed. Call Amendment 25 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 6. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
vote is closed. Point of order, Claire Hawhey. Thank you, President Officer. I was unable to connect to vote. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Hawkey. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. Okay, the result of the vote on Amendment 25 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, uh, 52, 32, sorry, no, 83. There were no abstentions. I'll just repeat that. Yes, 32, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, not agreed. And that ends consideration of amendments. As members be aware, at this point in proceedings, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in her view, any provision of the bill uh, relates to a protected uh, subject matter, that is, whether it uh, modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in the presiding officer's view, no provision of the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. And the next item of business is a debate on motion 13477 in the name of Ivan McKee on Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at stage three. I'd invite uh, members wishing to participate uh, to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, for the opportunity to address the Chamber today uh, on the Stage 3 debate on the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill. Uh, I would like to thank the Convener and members of the Economy and Fair Work Committee for their assiduous scrutiny of the Bill during Stages 1 and 2 and for their ongoing support for the me measures and small number of amendments we have made. I would also like to thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their input and everyone that gave evidence during the different stages of the Bill. Very importantly, I'd like uh, to give a big thanks to Scottish Government officials, the Accountant and uh, Bankruptcy and uh, legal colleagues in Scottish Government for helping guide me through this process, having picked up uh, the Bill in its later stages. And finally, I would like to thank my predecessor, Tom Arthur, for his hard work, dedication and commitment uh, to the development of this bill. This is a focused bill which makes small but important improvements and I believe this is reflective of the fact that our bankruptcy system here in Scotland is widely perceived as meeting our needs. More importantly, however, it represents a chance to make things better for a number of individuals with both serious mental health issues and problem debt. By creating the enabling power to establish a mental health moratorium through regulations, this will help improve the lives of those who are struggling with debt and serious mental health issues. The development of this bill has been a good example of co-production. Uh, the initial provisions in the bill were developed from the recommendations of stakeholder-led groups who reviewed each of the statutory debt solutions to determine what improvements could be made. The provisions have been subject to extensive public consultation and reflect stakeholder recommendations that have achieved a level of consensus. The bill has been further developed during the stages of the bill process where we have listened to feedback from committee members, particularly in their stage one report, and stakeholders to make further amendments to improve the bill. For the mental health moratorium, we promised and delivered a draft set of regulations to the economy and Fair Work Committee prior to stage three of this bill. In doing so, we provided them with the opportunity to see the policy intention of the mental health moratorium. In particular, we have listened to their concerns about the eligibility criteria and have widened it to allow more people access to the scheme. We will continue to engage with stakeholders as we further develop the regulations. This will include a public consultation giving stakeholders and Parliament the opportunity to continue to shape them into a scheme which will help the most vulnerable in our society. We will work with the advice and mental health sector to develop clear guidance and training to ensure a successful delivery of the mental health moratorium. And we will work with them to ensure the tools they need are available. Furthermore, we lodged amendments which were agreed to today which ensure that Parliament has the opportunity to fully scrutinise the regulations that will establish the mental health moratorium. 
We have also made a statutory commitment in the Bill to undertake a review of the mental health moratorium after five years of its introduction, where a full report will be published and presented to Scottish Ministers. We have implemented the Economy and Fair Works Committee's recommendations and introduced provisions that will allow a private insolvency practitioner to be discharged as trustee where the debtor has been non-cooperative and there are no further actions the trustee can take. We have also clarified the law to provide that for a successful petition for recall within the first six months of a sequestration, debts can be paid in full without interest being charged, but thereafter interest would have to be paid on those debts. We have listened to the witnesses who raised concerns with the committee, and after further engagement with sheriff officers, we have developed the provisions that provide them with more time to cite the individual uh, to appear at a sequestration hearing, as well as allowing them to serve arrestment schedules electronically. This will help make the process more efficient, cost-effective and up-to-date with modern times. We are aware that the topic of arrestment of funds is of great interest and the issue does require some clarity, particularly around protecting funds wholly derived from Social Security payments. As mentioned in our earlier session, we commit to consult on this and take the time to consider all views to ensure we get it right and ensure the measures taken do not have any unintended consequences. There are some other matters raised by stakeholders and their evidence to the committee which can be addressed through secondary legislation that we will continue to look at. This includes matters such as the minimum period for reapplying for bankruptcy under the minimal asset process and the minimum protected balance for earnings arrestments. As my predecessor said to the committee, these are things that can be addressed in secondary legislation and that I think is the best way to address them. It is also important to note that this bill is part of a wider programme of reform and that we have commissioned an independent review to assess how far current statutory solutions meet the needs of a modern economy. This work has been taken forward by Yvonne McDermott, OBE. Yvonne brings a wealth of experience to this work, having served as Chief Executive at Money Advice Scotland for many years. Yvonne has now issued a public consultation document to receive feedback on the current solutions and will reporting back to Scottish Ministers on the results in due course. I look forward to seeing this and continue the work to make our statutory debt solutions are fit for purpose. Moving forward, the real work starts here, and I look forward to working with Parliament, members of the committee and our stakeholders to help ensure that Scotland's statutory debt solutions meet the needs of the people of Scotland, particularly the most vulnerable in our society suffering from serious mental health issues with problem debt. I commend the bill to Parliament and I move that the Parliament agrees to the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Murdo Fraser. Uh, around six minutes, Mr Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I at the outset remind members of my register of interest and that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, although not uh, currently practising. And um, can I uh, start by thanking my colleagues on the Economy and Fair Work Committee for their scrutiny of the bill. Thank all those who gave us evidence. Thanks Spice for their uh, background briefings and to the committee clerks who assisted us throughout the uh, process. And I would also want to put on record my thanks to both ministers involved, to uh, Tom MacArthur and to Ivan McKee for their engagement throughout the process. I know Mr McKee was a very late substitution uh, stepping into the breach, but uh, I enjoyed uh, the conversations we had in terms of the bill. Um, it's fair to say this is a bill that has not provoked a great deal of political controversy, although some of the amendments we discussed both at stage two and today to generate a little bit more heat. Essentially, as the Minister set out, this bill provides some modest, albeit important, changes to bankruptcy legislation. The principal measure here is to introduce a specific protection for debtors who have a mental illness with the creation of a moratorium on debt recovery action. A similar measure was introduced to the law in England and Wales some years ago with the Breathing Space Scheme, where individuals receiving crisis treatment, encompassing those in compulsory treatment, as well as those with conditions of comparable severity who are receiving crisis emergency or acute treatment without compulsion, are protected from bankruptcy proceedings. It was clear from the committee's work that there was widespread support from stakeholders for the principle of a mental health moratorium to be introduced here in Scotland. However, there was also concern about the lack of detail about how such a memorandum would operate in practice. The committee expressed a concern in the stage one report that in being asked to agree the general principles of the bill, the question of how the moratorium would work in practice was being left open. 
I am pleased that the committee has now seen draft regulations indicating how the mental health moratorium will work in practice. It was in our view essential that a super affirmative provision put in the bill for approval of the mental health moratorium to allow Parliament more opportunity for scrutiny. And in that respect, I was pleased to see the Minister's Amendment 2 that was agreed by, committee, uh, agreed by Parliament rather, uh, this afternoon. Those who have debt problems who are suffering from acute mental illness should not face the added burden of the prospect of diligence against them. It is therefore very welcome to see the measures in this bill in relation to the mental health moratorium. And for that reason alone, we will be supporting the bill at stage three in a short time. In terms of the amendments discussed this afternoon, I did raise earlier the point of the unduly onerous burden on account holders, many of them banks or other financial institutions, from having to respond to numerous attempts at arrestments, even where there was to be a nil return. And I was interested in the figures the Minister set out in the debate that there are some 200,000 arrestments done annually in Scotland, of which only 2% are successful. So this clearly does create a substantial burden of administration on those who are having to report nil returns. It was a serious issue raised at stage one with the committee by NatWest Bank, and I know that Scottish Financial Enterprise have also been engaged on behalf of their members. So I welcome the assurance we had from the Minister earlier that he will engage with the financial services industry on this to try and find solutions. We know that some of those trying to make arrestments adopt a scattergun approach, and that can have significant administrative costs for those who are on the receiving end. So I welcome the Government saying they will take steps to address this, and I will be looking to hold the Minister to his commitment in this regard. Finally, let me just say in conclusion, Presiding officer, the bankruptcy law is there to be, triumph, to be fair to both debtor and creditor and to strike a balance. If we make bankruptcy law too favourable towards the debtor, we will see fewer institutions prepared to lend, leaving those with limited means driven into the hands of the illegal money lending sector, which is to no one's advantage. At the same time, the law needs to be able to, to provide appropriate protections to those who find themselves, often through no fault of their own, in financial difficulty. For those who have a mental illness, this bill provides an additional protection, and in that respect, it is very welcome. So let me conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, by confirming we will be supporting this bill at stage three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Uh, I now call on Daniel Johnson, uh, around five minutes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, and can I too uh, give my thanks uh, to the committee? Uh, for their hard work. I recognise this is a, an important bill, but it's a very technical one. And so, therefore, the hard work that they have done in providing the insight and scrutiny to these measures is really vital. And I recognise, as not being a member of that committee, I'm very reliant on that hard work. Uh, can I, too, also thank both Tom Arthur and Ivan McKee uh, for uh, 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 their constructive engagement over this? Uh, that has been in incredibly useful. And, and can I, in, in some ways, I think, uh, start off... Uh, where uh, Murdo Fraser left off. The role of bankruptcy is incredibly important. It's important for individuals who find themselves in crisis. That ability to pause, suspend and indeed write off debts is an important element to making sure that people are not unduly penalised when they find themselves in financial difficulties. I would also argue it's actually an important element of any well-functioning economy. It's actually the, the ability to be able to write off debts is actually quite an important element to enable a, a, an economy to continue to work. So on both sides it's important, but it's a particularly important element when so many people at this point in time, find themselves in financial difficulty. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, it's estimated that around 700,000 people are at risk of severe uh, 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 debt. Uh, and according to Step Change, um, uh, the debt charity, the, the average level of debt in terms of their clients is now £16,000. That's up 27%. And that is, I think, the very real impact of the cost of living crisis, the doubling of household bills, the, the third increase that food bills uh, have gone up by. And indeed, we know that that's against the context of rising uh, uh, instances of poor mental health across our society. So this is a timely bill. It's an important bill providing people protection. 
uh, when they find themselves in these circumstances. Now, it has to be said that much of the, the, the critical elements of this bill have been left to regulations, and it's useful that the government have brought these forward in draft form. But let me just provide some comments, and, and this comes again with the full acknowledgement and connaissance that I'm not sitting on the committee. But in terms of my understanding of uh, the, the uh, uh, examination of those last week, I would raise the following points. First of all is the criteria. Uh, and I think particularly uh, the, the contribution of a mental health condition to the debt being a necessary requirement. What I would argue is not whether or, or the, the, the reasons why that debt has occurred, it's about the person's ability to manage them that is a much more important uh, criteria. Likewise, the need to, to, uh, for those debts to have been accrued uh, prior to entering the solution I think is problematic. I think this needs to focus much more squarely on the, the ability of the individual to manage that debt. I would still question the need for a register at all. I recognise that's no longer a public register, but I think uh, if it has been deemed uh, necessary or that it's appropriate by mental health professionals that such arrangement is appropriate, that should be sufficient. I, I'm not entirely clear that I understand the, the need for a register. Uh, and likewise, I think we need to look at both uh, the debts covered, that the only moratorium debts are, are covered. I think it, it, there needs to be further examination around informal or verbal agreements uh, beyond uh, simply uh, 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 those that are written down. And likewise, the timescales. I think there's a, a broad variety of timescales set out in the regulations, some being 28 days, some simply 14. I would suggest that 14 days is a very short time frame for people to get uh, affairs into order. I think what my broader point is this, uh, is around the access. I think compulsory treatment, while that has been softened, the reality is, is that getting access to crisis treatment, whether that's a, a, on a voluntary basis or otherwise, is still incredibly hard. I have within my constituency the Royal Edinburgh Hospital, and I can tell you on the basis of my casework, you have to be in severe mental health crisis at a point where you're in personal jeopardy to get anywhere near that sort of crisis care. My fear is that there's a huge number of people whose mental health conditions absolutely is relevant to, to their debt, whose uh, condition will make, mean that they are unable to manage it, that simply will not meet that criteria. And just finally, in closing, I would just like to make a, a, a brief comment about framework bills. I think part of the issue here is this is important, but it's been hard to examine the, 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 the detail. Now, I understand the need for framework legislation. The, the need for regulating making powers, particularly around setting thresholds, specific amounts, uh, about uh, uh, delivering the how. But I do think legislation needs to specify what the intent of legislation is, what it, it seeks to set out, even if the detail of that is going to be left to regulation. Ultimately, this is about the balance between the executive and the legislature. legislature. The reality is this legislation, like many others, leaves the balance heavily towards the executive. And I would say it's not actually in the executive's interest for that balance to be uh, that far uh, or to their side of the equation. Because ultimately, when it comes to technical measures, the processes of this parliament are there to test legislation, to ensure that it's right, that it will have the intended effect. And I think in areas such as this, those tests can be helpful to good legislation and indeed helpful to the government. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I now call Maggie Chapman around four minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to speak in support of this legislation on behalf of the Scottish Greens today. I want to begin by expressing my sincere thanks to my colleagues on the Economy and Fair Work Committee and the Clarks and Spice researchers who supported our scrutiny of this bill during its earlier stages. Thanks, too, to Tom Arthur, the Minister who had responsibility for this bill previously, and to Ivan McKee for their willingness to engage and the time they took to discuss different elements of the legislation over the past few months. And perhaps most importantly, I want to thank all the organisations and individuals who contributed to our scrutiny, in person, at committee, in written evidence, in briefings and meetings. Citizens Advice Scotland, Advice Talks, Money Advice Scotland, the Child Poverty Action Group and so many others have all helped make this bill and the regulations that accompany it stronger and more robust. We spent much time in our committee scrutiny on the very important mental health moratorium that this bill introduces. It is right, I believe, that we give proper consideration to small but potentially transformative issues and the mental health moratorium is, I think, just that. 
In the midst of the technical changes to our bankruptcy and diligence law, there is the potential to make the lives of people who are struggling with debt and poor mental health much, much more manageable. Because, and we heard this very clearly in committee, debt has a huge impact on mental health. Participants in the engagement session we held with One Parent Families and the Poverty Alliance told us their personal stories of mental health issues spiralling out of control because of the pressures of debts, alongside other issues associated with family, work, physical health, and so on. It was very effective. And as Becca Stacey from the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute said, and I quote, we know that people with mental health problems are three and a half times more likely to be in debt and half the people who are in problem debt are experiencing a mental health problem. So it's a vicious circle. Debt and poor mental health are clearly linked and reinforcing. So I am pleased, therefore, that the Scottish Government has, in the draft regulations for the mental health moratorium it has laid, listened to that lived experience of those who have struggled with both mental ill health and debt, and also to the advice from those who seek to support them. The widening of the moratorium's eligibility criteria to include people who do not have compulsory treatment orders will benefit many people, giving those receiving voluntary treatment the much-needed support provided by the moratorium. But, as Daniel Johnson has already outlined, there is, we believe, still more we need to do in this space. There isn't, uh, we, the, the eligibility criteria remains too narrow. But on those regulations, there are other aspects that still give me cause for concern. I remain to be convinced that the register is appropriate, even though that what is proposed is not a public one. We heard quite clearly in evidence that this could exacerbate the stigma experienced by people struggling with both poor mental health and debt. And that stigma comes not necessarily from that public information, uh, that information being publicly available, but just them knowing that there's a register at all. Stigma destroys people's lives, and we should not be reinforcing structures and systems of oppression that we know will stigmatise vul vulnerable people. So I look forward to the further scrutiny, future scrutiny, of those regulations with interest. The final issue I want to address in my opening remarks this afternoon is on the need for financial advice and support organisations and others to have the support and training and resources they need to do their jobs effectively. This legislation will not have the positive impact as it is intended to have if frontline debt advisers and mental health professionals don't have the time, training or resources they need to do their jobs. <coughs> Specialist trauma-informed training and support will be needed so that they are adequately equipped to support people struggling with both mental ill health and debt. I don't have time, presiding officer, to address all the other issues in the bill just now, but I look forward to the rest of the debate this afternoon and am pleased to support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. We move to the open debate. I call first Ruth Maguire to be followed by Colin Smith. Uh, up to four minutes. Ms Maguire. Thank you, presiding officer. I'll be pleased to vote for the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at decision time this evening. This relatively small bill does not propose radical change. However, the bill represents a chance to make things better for a small number of individuals with both severe debt problems and severe mental health issues, that is not a small thing. If the bill passes tonight, it will do three things. It will give Scottish ministers powers to create a mental health moratorium. It will make minor and technical reforms to bankruptcy legislation and make changes to the law on debt enforcement. According to research from the Money Advice Service, more than 55% of adults have struggled with their well-being because of money problems at some time in their lives. 38% pointed the finger at debt as the biggest financial issue linked to suffering with mental illness, with being unable to cope with everyday costs such as bills coming in at a close second. A recent report from the Money Advice Service found that 59% of people contacting them for debt advice reported that they had been diagnosed with a mental health condition. This is much higher than the UK average of 17%, highlighting how money problems and mental health and wellbeing can be interlinked. And of course, as Maggie Chapman mentioned in her um, speech there, the issue of money and mental health problems can cycle, with mental health problems making it harder to earn and manage money or ask for help leading to financial difficulty, and that financial difficulty in turn increasing stress and anxiety, perhaps exacerbated by collection activity from creditors or going without essentials, increasing mental health problems, and so on and so on. 
The bill before us contains powers which would allow Scottish ministers to create a mental health moratorium to protect people with serious mental health issues from debt recovery action. I understand that the idea of a moratorium providing a special protection to those with serious mental health conditions achieved broad support in the bankruptcy and debt advice review consultation. And as, has been, as has been laid out, responses to the Economy and Fair Work Committee also showed strong support for the principle of such protection, um, notwithstanding people's um, questions over, over the details, of course. The reforms proposed in the Bill are relatively minor, with some benefiting creditors and some benefiting debtors. In summary, the debt enforcement changes would require bodies like banks and employers to tell creditors why attempts to arrest a debtor's assets have been unsuccessful, require debtors to be provided with a debt advice and information package in advance of the relevant hearing for diligence on dependents, extend the time frame a debtor has to reclaim assets seized in their home, and increase flexibility around when money attachment can be carried out on business premises. In conclusion, the Bill will make a small but important change to bankruptcy and diligence, and the introduction of a mental health moratorium is an important step that will help those with the most severe mental health conditions and financial challenges. I will be very pleased to vote for that tonight, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Maguire. I now call Colin Smith around four minutes. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. When the Bankruptcy and Diligence Bill was first published, stakeholders raised concerns it didn't go far enough. It didn't deliver the protections we need for the most vulnerable at a time families are facing a real cost of living crisis. There has been some progress since on the mental health moratorium. I welcome the decision to widen the criteria and also not to proceed with a public register, though still have concerns over the need for any form of register. And weaknesses do remain with the draft regulations. Alan McIntosh from Advice Talk Scotland, Sits Advice Scotland and this Parliament's Economy and Fair Work Committee have highlighted several concerns. Firstly, the moratorium won't prevent people from being evicted from their home or having it repossessed, as is the case in the rest of the UK. In Scottish House and Law, a judge should only grant an eviction or repossession if it is reasonable to do so in all circumstances. This, however, ignores a crucial point. This protection is only available if you can seek advice and obtain representation at any court or tribunal case. Clearly, someone suffering a mental health crisis may not be able to do this, or the process of doing so might be too much. It could set back their recovery completely. Secondly, people will only be protected from debts owed to the date of award of the moratorium. Individuals will have to maintain their ongoing liabilities. If they fail, their moratorium could be cancelled. Thirdly, creditors will have the right to challenge the legality of a mental health moratorium and the right to request cancellation. However, surely it is the medical professional that has the expertise to decide whether someone should be under the moratorium, not the creditor. These are just some concerns on the regulations for the proposed moratorium. I could have mentioned others, such as that. The, the member take yeah, certainly will, yeah. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. The member has raised a number of issues that the committee were interested in. It's just as the member agree with me that the issue of capacity uh, for people who might wish to access the scheme is still to be addressed. And this is an area the minister might want to give further consideration to. Colin Smith. I thank Claire Baker very much for that intervention. I do hope that the Minister, in his concluding remarks, will address that point. It was one that was certainly debated at some length within the committee, and it is certainly one that does need to be addressed. And there are others I could have mentioned, for example, the lack of detail on enforcement action that will be taken against creditors who fail to adhere to the moratorium. Um, President officer, money worries take their toll on most people, but the anxiety and the stress it creates for those suffering from a mental health crisis is all the greater. Many are simply not in the state of mind to deal with the debt. There can be a downward spiral. As the debt grows, the mental health impact also grows. Some members may have seen that the survey carried out by Advice Talk Scotland advisor Alan McIntosh it shows earnings arrestments left people in severe hardship. Most were unable to pay for the essentials, had fallen into arrears, were left unable to pay other debts. Many respondents reported a deterioration in their mental health. One woman said she was struggling to keep her head above water because of the amount the courts were taking off her wages. Some had left their jobs to escape arrestment. So I welcome the government's decision to consult further on this issue and to bring forward changes on earnings arrestments levels. 
Preventing creditors or arresting people's benefits from their bank account is also vital. And I acknowledge that the Government's commitment to stop this from happening through my amendment. Presiding officer, we know that mental health and money's problems go hand in hand. People can get caught in a vicious cycle where the debt builds and builds. So the overarching aim of this bill to support vulnerable people facing financial hardship is an important one. But the proposed regulations still need to go further. I also want to add my thanks to all those who gave evidence to the committee as this bill went through Parliament, the committee clerks for the work they did, and in government officials and ministers uh, th themselves. Uh, I would like to pay particular tribute, however, to Alan McIntosh from Advice Talk Scotland. He has been forensic in his scrutiny of the bill and regulations. He has brought attention to several weaknesses that may not have come to light otherwise, and he has put forward several constructive proposals that could help provide much-needed help to people struggling with their mental health and facing severe hardship. And I am grateful for that input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. We now move to closing speeches, and I call first Maggie Chapman, around four minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank all those who have contributed to the debate this afternoon and the discussion of amendments earlier on. The bill, this bill might not be the most exciting piece of legislation or politically heated, as Murdo Fraser has alluded to, uh, alluded to. It has not attracted a great deal of attention, but it does some very, very important, if small, things to support people who are struggling with debt and poor mental health, whilst ensuring creditors are protected too. I want to focus my closing remarks on what we need to do after this legislation passes this afternoon, as we know it will. We must listen to those who are directly involved in supporting people who are in debt and struggle with mental ill health. And we must listen to those who have direct lived experience from both of, of these issues. Citizens Advice Scotland and others remain concerned that the regulations we have uh, in draft form that will bring the mental health moratorium into effect will not actually deliver completely the policy intent of this legislation. It is not clear, for example, that the regulations will provide the space and security needed for individuals to prioritise their mental health recovery and halt the vicious cycle of increasing debt and worsening mental health. Because we know recovery from mental ill health is never a linear process. It can cycle through improvements and setbacks and can be totally derailed by unpredictable and unforeseen events. People who have severe mental illness face many barriers to much-needed support where treatment and crisis can fluctuate. So it is often enduring and may not be a situation that one-off treatment or, or one-off support works and, and, and deals with the issue. In fact, it is very rare that one-off treatment is all that will be required. So, and as Colin Smith has already outlined this afternoon, the, for the mental health moratorium to be effective, it needs to do some very, very specific things. It needs to protect individuals from eviction. You cannot expect somebody to take their mental health recovery seriously if they are worried about losing their home. It needs to protect individuals from debts accrued after the moratorium is awarded, including removing the requirement for maintaining ongoing payments. It needs to also remove the ability, uh, apologies, of, of the creditor's right to challenge or request cancellation of a mental health moratorium. These are the kinds of issues that we really do need to take seriously as we consider the draft, the draft regulations in, in, in the coming months. And I do hope that the Scottish Government will listen to these concerns and amend the, those regulations before they are, are brought to, to Parliament for approval. Because this bill does matter, this bill will make a significant difference to a, a number of people who need it to work for them if we get those regulations right, if we have the eligibility criteria set wide enough, if we ensure that it doesn't, it doesn't embed stigmatising uh, measures such as, as a, a, a register, and if we make sure that it actually gives people the security and safety that they need to deal not only with their mental health uh, recovery, but with, with their debts, because that will be good for them, it will be good for their families and communities, and it will be good for creditors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. And I now call on Paul O'Kane again, around four minutes. Mr O'Kane. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it's a pleasure to close this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. Um, 
on these benches, as we have heard um, from my colleague Daniel Johnson, we have sought to support the aims and principles of the bill. Uh, and I think we've heard across the chamber today that it is a bill that's technical in nature, but I think has had the scope uh, to make a real impact in terms of many of the challenges that exist uh, in this area. And there is much more, as we know, to be done. I, I would like at the outset to join colleagues in thanking um, both Tom Arthur, the, the previous minister, and indeed Ivan McKee for um, their stewardship of the bill and the way they've engaged, and indeed for their officials uh, in that regard as well. I, I think a lot of our debate this afternoon has been rightly taken up by thinking about those uh, in our society who are vulnerable uh, and who, because of other factors or because of the debt they face, deserve uh, support to escape that problem and get onto a more stable footing and do that with uh, compassion. I think that's uh, very important. And I think that's why there has been such strong support for a mental health moratorium on debt recovery actions. Uh, and I think we've heard that quite uh, roundly across the chamber today and indeed um, calls uh, for the provisions to be as strong as possible. Uh, and that's why, although a small change in terms of the amendment that um, I was successful in securing, um, to change that word to must, I think it is important because it shows the intent uh, within the legislation that this must happen, and I think it shows the will of Parliament today that that was um, supported. We know that the regulations uh, have been drafted and brought forward by the Minister, so it does look as though that moratorium will continue to progress and come into effect, we hope, in the near future. But, of course, there are concerns remaining over the level of strength and, indeed, the protections that will be provided by that moratorium, um, outlined by Maggie Chapman, Daniel Johnson uh, and other speakers. And we know that uh, many organisations, such as Citizens Advice, have called for protections from eviction or repossession from ongoing liabilities to be included. And we've also heard um, in the exchange between my colleagues Claire Baker and Colin Smith about the need to do more around that to um, create a process that would enable access for those who lack capacity. So I think it's clear that there is still time to address those concerns before regulations go through uh, the necessary parliamentary scrutiny. And I do uh, hope the Minister will recognise those concerns, uh, as well as those uh, not just in this chamber, but held by stakeholders. I, I want to reflect on some of that, certainly, in his closing, um, and I'm sure uh, as the, the, this uh, progresses. I think more broadly beyond the moratorium, we know that the bill could have uh, went further in many places and could have been stronger. Indeed, the Economy and Fair Work Committee um, made a number of recommendations to the government uh, at stage one which have not been taken forward, but I think there is opportunity for further work, uh, further dialogue uh, in that regard. But I think overall we uh, look at this bill and we see an improvement upon the status quo. We shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and the enemy of progress. Um, not uh, when the scale of the debt problem facing Scottish families is as large as it is. And every positive measure, however small, goes some way in helping uh, them just a little bit more than they are currently uh, being helped. So this isn't necessarily the end of the line. Um, I think it's scope to strengthen and support protections and enhance regulation or better working practices. And I just want to say at this point we should uh, continue to engage and learn from third sector organisations uh, and I think we're all very grateful for the contribution that they have made in this process, not least advice talks as mentioned by Colin Smith, um, Citizens Advice Scotland uh, and indeed Aber Lauer. And I mentioned in my contribution on the amendments the innovative work that has been done such as the Tayside pilot run by Aber Lauer, providing that wraparound support to families in problem debt, and I think we should all take an opportunity to engage with those sorts of organisations where we can. So, to bring to a conclusion, Presiding Officer, in this cost of living crisis, people have been pushed further and further into debt, uh, with the Money and Pension Service estimating 700,000 people in Scotland are at risk or already in problem debt. Those people we know can't afford to wait for a perfect solution to come along. We need to use the provisions of this bill to be of benefit to those people, and I do hope that we continue to engage on all of these issues, not least the mental health moratorium, uh, as we go forward uh, and try to impact as much change as we can. I'm very grateful. Thank you. And I call on Brian Whittle. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I, can I apologise to my colleagues, firstly, for not being able to be in the, the chamber for the debate? Um, and, but, and given the consensual nature of this debate and of the bill itself, the Chamber will be pleased to hear that I will be keeping my contribution uh, to a minimum. And can I start by echoing the thanks of uh, others uh, from my co co committee colleagues to all those who gave us evidence uh, about the bill, to SPICE for the very helpful background briefings and to the committee clerks. And as been demonstrated in this debate, the committee were mostly in agreement with, uh, with very little discourse through the evidence gathering process. 
My colleague Margot Fraser, with his usual attention to detail, helpfully highlighted that the bankruptcy provides a solution for those who find themselves in a situation of not being able to meet their financial obligations, avoiding the need for creditors to pursue those individuals indefinitely, in effect offering a way to clear the deck, so to speak, but all the while understanding that there is a balance to be sought between creditors and, de and debtors. In evidence, and in this afternoon, we've heard that in, uh, the cases we're considering is predominantly public bodies such as HMRC, local councils, and especially council tax arrears that are often the main creditors. And this throws up the need to balance the needs of debtors against the collection of funds to support public services. The bill itself, presenting officer, uh, as has been mentioned by members, it is mostly minor and technical changes to an existing bankruptcy legislation. Much of the evidence taken and discussed centred around the debts, de debtors with significant mental illness and therefore their capacity to adequately attend to the debt recovery procedures against them, which we all agree was a legitimate reason to support a moratorium on the recovery of said debt. Others in the debate have cited a similar scheme in England and Wales, breathing space, where individuals receiving what is termed crisis treatment are offered such protections. These includes those subject to compulsory orders, but crucially, those suffering from conditions of compatible severity receiving crisis, emergency or acute treatment without compulsion. Although there was agreement, as has been mentioned in this debate, I think the lack of detail as to how the moratorium would operate in a practical sense did raise concerns. It's therefore good to see the draft regulations indicating how the mental health moratorium would work in practice have been made available. And again, the provision for a super affirmative procedure is very welcome. It's been raised that creditors also need some assurance and support, and it is again welcome that the Minister has assured he will engage with the financial sector to look for optimum solutions. Presenting officer, having a debt issue while suffering from an acute mental health issue is a situation that those who find themselves in that position should expect a degree of protection from. Indeed, the debt issue itself could be, re be a reason for poor mental health. That alone is a reason enough to support the bill at stage three, and we will therefore be voting for the bill at decision time. Presenting officer. Thank you. I now call on Ivan Wiki to wind up. Up to six minutes, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. I'm and I'm uh, a pleasure to close this uh, this debate, um, and I'm grateful to all the members who have contributed to the debate and also lodged amendments and took part in the very um, constructive discussions we had um, around the bill over the past, uh, the past few weeks since I've been involved. Um, and just to touch on a few of those points briefly, um, although by no means all of them in the brief time I have available. Um, in regards to Murdo Fraser's point that he raises about uh, the potential for uh, additional workload on the banking sector, just to reiterate uh, and rest assured, there will be uh, my commitment to work with the sector to minimise um, uh, any, any effort that's required on their behalf by way of uh, onerous workload. And indeed, um, hopefully, we can work our way through and get better data to understand the ongoing situation. It can perhaps lead to a reduced workload in, in future, which would certainly be our intent. Uh, and also thank Murdo Fraser and indeed Daniel Johnson for raising the very important point about the importance of balance in the bankruptcy process uh, and its uh, critical impact on individuals, on businesses and indeed on the overall economy that we get a functioning uh, bankruptcy system uh, that works, uh, works for everyone and get that balance uh, correct and it's in that uh, intention and that spirit of course that we seek to continually improve uh, the legislation and the regulations around this, uh, th this issue. Um, Daniel John raised a number of issues uh, around about uh, regulations um, and uh, rest assured those have been noted and will be be, um, uh, uh, considered and, and, uh, and this point round about uh, framework bill, which I know is a point that he's, he's keen to make uh, whenever he has the opportunity, and that certainly was, uh, was heard. I give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I, I, in particular, around the, the, the former point he just made, I think how we define crisis is actually really quite important, and what nature of treatment or what nature of condition meets the threshold, because I think. The reality is that acute care in terms of our mental health system 
is actually quite difficult to access at the moment, and so therefore getting that definition right in the regulation is important. I just wonder if the Minister might comment on that particular point. Thank you. Minister. He raised an important point, and uh, absolutely on that issue, as in uh, a number of other issues that have been raised by members this afternoon, um, the Government, through the process we're taking forward on the regulations and, and beyond the implementation, will be very much focused on understanding um, how we can best um, find uh, uh, um, definitions there that, that work for everyone, uh, everyone concerned, bearing in mind the points that Daniel Johnson has rightly, rightly raised. Um, other members made a, a number of very important points. Um, I don't have time to go through them all. Certainly, Maggie Smith, uh, sorry, Maggie, uh, Maggie Chapman and Colin Smith um, made um, the, the business of renaming members ad hoc from the government benches. Um, <laughs> To, to make the point, they raised very similar points, in fact, <laughs> which um, uh, were very, um, very, uh, very, well, uh, very well made, and indeed uh, they have my commitment from the government benches. We'll continue to consult publicly on, uh, on those regulations and to work with stakeholders and um, members to ensure that uh, we deliver um, solutions taken on board all of those uh, very important points. Um, as I mentioned, the draft regulations sitting now with the committee will be subject to a public consultation and I will reflect on the feedback and further work with uh, stakeholders and the committee to shape these regulations ensuring they can help deliver their intention and help improve the lives of people who are struggling with debt and uh, serious mental health issues and, and furthermore with amendment 2 being agreed to earlier today there will be more time indeed for parliament to scrutinise the regulations uh, when laid to ensure that they are fit for, uh, for purpose and while uh, parliament has rejected some of the amendments uh, debated today and indeed uh, my thanks to members who chose not to press their amendments having heard uh, commitments from the government benches um, then uh, the, the particular on attachment of property and funds I am as I have said sympathetic to the aims behind them and will work with members uh, to take uh, regulation forward where appropriate. And the Scottish Government agrees it is important welfare payments are protected for the purposes for which they are paid. However, it is also important that we get that right, so take time to consider this and a statutory requirement to consult before making regulations is the correct way to proceed. We have also committed to consulting on a different approach to the banding for earnings arrestment to reduce their impact on those on low incomes. And it strikes me that, again, taking time to consider this fully will be a fairer and more effective way of addressing this issue. And throughout the process, we have also committed to further issues raised in bankruptcy that can be achieved through secondary legislation. We will continue to work with stakeholders on these issues to ensure our statutory debt solutions are fit for purpose. And this, of course, is certainly not the end of the process. We will continue to engage and work with stakeholders and the Parliament to improve Scotland's statutory debt solutions, ensuring they meet the needs of the people of Scotland. This bill, as has been recognised by many members this afternoon, is indeed only a small step and may help only a limited number of people, but it is nonetheless an important step in demonstrating this Parliament's commitment to helping all the people we represent, and I commend it to the Parliament. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Point of order, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I apologise to you and to the uh, Chamber, and I'll be as brief as I can. At First Minister's questions earlier on today, I invited the uh, Deputy First Minister to uh, commit to ongoing support for the Inter International Island Games taking place in Orkney, as well as to congratulate the young athletes from Orkney and Shetland taking part in last weekend's junior inter-county. Uh, inter uh, at the time, I should have declared um, an interest as the former chair of the Orkney Islands Game Bid Committee. Uh, and while I'm on my feet, uh, let me declare an interest as the uncle of Emily MacArthur, who won the 400 metres and the 800 metres. <laughs> before joining her sister Ella MacArthur and the rest of the hockey team to beat the Shetland uh, Team 2-1. <laughs> I recognise this is not a point of order, uh, but I also recognise that Emily MacArthur and Ella will be mortified at this, but in the interest of transparency, I thought it important to put that <laughs> on, the in, on the record. I think it's probably fair to say that that's the first time a non-point of order has been applauded so warmly um, in this chamber. Um, I think I'm not going to add anything to that, Mr MacArthur. You are well aware that's not a point of order, but your sentiments and comments are on the record. Now, we've concluded the debate on bankruptcy and diligence Scotland Bill at stage three. We'll move to the next item of business. There's one question to be put as a result of today's business. 
and I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward now, and I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And the question is that decision time be brought forward now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that motion 13477 in the name of Ivan McKee on Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. And as this is a motion to pass the bill at Stage 3, the question must be decided by division. And members have been voting um, throughout the afternoon, and I would suggest that they refresh their app before doing so. But the question is that motion 13477 in the name of Ivan McKee on Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Mary Goujon for a point of order. A uh, point of order, Presiding Officer. My app was frozen. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Goujon. We'll ensure that is recorded. I call Sarah Boyack for a point of order. I can confirm that your vote has been recorded, Ms Boyack. The result of the vote on motion 13477 in the name of Ivan McKee is yes, 109. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Decision time and I close this meeting.